Richard's been leading us uh, since the beginning of the year on a series on faith and all the different permutations of that. And when you start looking at it in scripture, it's like looking at all the different facets of the diamond because it's just absolutely everywhere. And when you start looking at scripture and looking for examples of faith, they just absolutely pop out everywhere. But you know, when you look at the common vernacular and the things that we see on, on television or on social media, we find the word faith used a lot. Super Bowl today, Chiefs gonna win? Yeah. Gotta, gotta have faith. Doesn't mean exactly the same thing, does it? In scripture, when we talk about faith, we're not talking about hope. We're not talking about fingers crossed. We're talking about an assurance that we can have faith in God. Well, that sounds good. Faith in God about what? Faith in God that he will be faithful. Yeah, but what, what's that mean? That he will keep his promises. He will keep absolutely every promise. This message is a little weird. It might be one of the worst you've ever heard. But <laughs> as Richard's been talking, I, I have a couple, I've had a couple uh, uh, stories or encounters that where I've seen people exhibit faith. And I'm going to talk about those for just a couple little stories, and then I'm going to read somebody else's sermon to you. The first story I had to do, it was a, one of the late October days where it's, it's a little warm during the day, but it cools off quickly in the evening. And Bob and I have been driving tractors all day, planting winter wheat. I drove in front with a disc to soften the ground, and Bob came behind with a planter. It's actually called a drill if you're a farm person. Came along with the planter, and we just went in ever smaller circles, like when you mow your yard around the field. And every once in a while, you'd have to stop and fill up the planter. And so we stopped to fill up the drill once, and it was the sun had just started going down, and it was still orange in the west, and stars popping out in the east. We drove up to the grain truck, and we got the big auger going, which makes a lot of noise, and filled the bins with seed. And we hadn't talked to each other very much, and it, there was a lot of noise going on. You couldn't hear yourself think. But once the bins were full, and, every, and we shut off the auger, the evening became very, very quiet and very still. It was that sort of twilight when the, night, when the day birds are still making some sounds and the night birds are just waking up to make sounds. And the, once the auger was shut off, you could hear the sounds of the tractors with the metal cooling and popping and sounding like just the first few hailstones of a hailstorm. And we stood there on the platform, pushing the weed around into the bins. We didn't have to. The bins were made and the wheat didn't have to go in the corners, but if you ever put your hand in the wheat, warm wheat that's been in the back of the truck all day and the evening's cooling off, putting your hand in seed is so much different than putting your hand in plastic or putting your hand in any other sort of beads. It has a, it has a feel of life to it. And it's a very pleasant thing to do. And while we were standing there, he looked at me sideways and he said, did I ever tell you why this land's special to me? He told me many times, but I like the story, so I just kept quiet. <laughs> the land that we were on was divided by a creek. Half of it was on one side, half of it was on the other. And he said, when my dad had this land, there, was a bridge, there wasn't a, a bridge across the creek that could handle the, the weight of the wheat truck. And so we had to park on the other side of the creek. And while my dad was planting the wheat, it was my job, 11, 12 years old, to bring 20 buckets of wheat across the creek. You could see him doing that. 11 year old trying to carry a bucket of wheat dragging it through the creek, dragging it up the side, not spilling much because you know how dads are, <laughs> with tears of frustration. And he'd drag him up, and every time 
he had to drag him, he had to drag him farther and farther and farther because the tractor is more and more in the middle of the field. You can see him getting a little older, starting to get a little man growth to the point where he could carry two. And he said, my dad always said to me, when he'd stop and we'd fill up, he said, one day this will be yours. And that's why this land is special to me. The power, the incredible power of a promise kept. Paul tells us in first, Second Corinthians, first chapter, so no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes in Jesus Christ. I don't think I said that yes like Paul would have said. I think when we think about the promises, no matter how many, they are all yes. Reminds me of watching my, my kids play Little League Ball when it was something was really close and something was happening and the pitcher would throw the perfect ball and he'd strike him out and he'd turn around and he'd go, yes! I think that's the kind of yes. When you start looking at no matter how many promises God has made, they will all be yes through Christ Jesus. She was sitting in my office distraught. You could tell she'd been crying. She called and she asked to come over to talk to me. I said, sure. I really didn't know her. I knew who she was. She was a, a college girl who had gone away to college before I, before I came to that church. I knew her folks, but I didn't know her. And she came in and she, and she said, I need to talk to you about something. I said, sure. She said, I, I think I'm going to have to break up with my boyfriend because he just refuses to believe. I said, what are you thinking? They'd been dating three years. His family loved her and she loved them. He had nieces and nephews, and they loved her and she loved them. And the same was true with him and her family. She said, when I, when I first started dating him, I thought, maybe, I thought maybe I could have an impact. I thought maybe I could, I could bring him to Christ. And now I'm not sure, and I really don't know what to do. What advice would you give her? Oh, I forgot to tell you there was somebody else in the room, so I didn't have to say much. What I watched was her wrestle with the Holy Spirit and listening to God. I didn't have to give her a bit of advice. She had reached the point where she had ignored, not ignored, but disregarded what the Spirit had been telling her to the point that it had become a crisis in her life. And she made her own decision. And she, she made the decision to be faithful. But she did not leave a happy girl. Sometimes deciding to be faithful will break your heart. Have you seen other situations like this? where people kept promises and were blessings to others. In our society, we don't, we don't break our promises, we just change our mind. You know. Yeah, I know what I said when we got married, but I changed my mind. You know. Now I'm gonna read part of somebody else's sermon. It actually comes out of the Bible, so don't be too worried. <laughs> there are two books of the Bible that are either all sermon or mostly sermon. The book of Deuteronomy 
Moses, it's Moses' farewell speech. And it's 34 chapters long, and for 32 chapters, it's Moses talking to the people of Israel. I hope they have breaks sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's long enough if you know it's coming. You could sell, you know, a vendor could walk around and sell Cokes and stuff to, to that. 32 chapters. This isn't, I'm not reading out of Deuteronomy. The last two chapters are just basically how Moses' life ended in the, the last instructions he gave to Joshua. The other book of the Bible that's, that's thought to be a, just one sermon is chopped up into chapters is the book of Hebrews. We don't know who wrote Hebrews, which is really fascinating. It's, you get together with somebody who studies this stuff and it's just fascinating. It almost comes to fisticuffs sometimes. <laughs> we don't know. It seems like, well, okay, you, so you know the epistles when they start. Romans, 1st, 2nd, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Do you know how they're put in that order? By size, from the largest to the smallest. And then when you finish the, the letters that Paul wrote, is Hebrews. So we know Paul didn't write, he wasn't considered to have written Hebrews because it's a lot longer than some of the others. Anyway, I digress. Nothing wrong with my eyes, my arms are just too short. <laughs> Do not throw away the confidence, your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what, is, what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God, one who pleased God, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about the things not seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise, because he was looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father, because he considered him faithful who made the promise. And so from this one man, he as good as dead, came the descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and countless as the sands on the seashore. All these people, all these people were living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on the earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. 
For if they'd been thinking in the country that they left, they certainly would have had an opportunity to rec return instead. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly, one, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt, gave instructions about his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's, king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than all the treasures of Egypt, and he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw, I, know, I like this, he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry ground, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to talk about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flame, flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others, others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while others were chained, put to prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all, these were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. God had some, planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. By faith. There's a poet that I was forced to study in college several times because I couldn't pass the class. <laughs> Sidney Lanier, who wrote an epic poem about the marshes of Glen. Exciting, isn't it? 
the Marshes of Glynn, which is a, um, a salt marsh in Georgia, an estuary area, where when the tide goes out, it's fresh water. When the tide comes in, it's salt water. And so it's a, really difficult for plants to live there, for animals to live there. And he writes this long poem about all the plants and the animals and all that stuff. And in the middle of that, he talks about the marsh hen who lives in the middle of all of this. And he has these two lines. As the marsh hen builds on the watery sod, I have builded my life on the goodness of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for those who have gone before us, the cloud of witnesses, the faithful people. We thank you for the examples of faith that we have seen in our lives, in other people, in the times when we were faithful and you blessed us for it. Help us to build our lives on the goodness of God.